strange lands like this provide a natural home for wildlife, provide clean water, and support a major industry, the livestock business. Shortages of food throughout the world have stirred up new interest toward the rangelands. The demand for red meat production will increase, not to mention the mounting pressures of industry and recreation. It uh, reminds me of something a man named John Wesley Powell once said. He said that there is a kind of land that's not a forest land, nor is it always suited for cultivation, and it calls for unique management principles. This land is, is called native grazing land. Well, let's see if we find out just what he meant. We'll look over a five-state area called the Old West Region. Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, and Wyoming. A big country, a major part of our American rangelands. Within the United States, a large portion of the rangelands are located within the Old West region. It is here you can find a great variety of rangelands like the Alpine grasslands, the sand hills, the mixed prairie, sagebrush, and badlands. The earliest inhabitants were the nomadic Indian tribes. They shared their vast country with neighboring tribes and with wild cattle the buffalo, the provider for the people of the plains. By the early 1800s, the Indians caught sight of a different man. He was not of a neighboring tribe. Instead, he came to settle an empire. St. Louis, Missouri by the Overland, Mormon, and Oregon trails, guided by Chimney Rock, Mitchell Pass, and the wagon ruts of those ahead. The Homestead Act of 1862 generated even a greater number of immigrants. Any adventurous man or woman could, could own 160 prime acres. The farmland east of the Missouri yielded good crops. Well then, why couldn't the land of the west do the same? In 1838, Daniel Webster wrote, What do we want with this vast, worthless area, this region of savages and wild beasts, of deserts, shifting sands, and whirlwinds of dust, of cactus and prairie dogs? I will never vote one cent from the public treasury to place the Pacific Coast one inch nearer to Boston than it is now. The cattleman viewed the open range differently. He found an endless sea of grass for bigger and better cattle herds, herds for the markets to the east, beef for the railroad camps pushing their rails across the new land. Indian reservations, well, they took what meat was left over. But the cattleman was concerned. He was now sharing his land with not only the sheep man, but the sod busters as well. The 
droughts and blizzards of the 1880s didn't seem to discourage the sodbusters. They were encouraged by the Homestead Act of 1909. And again in 1916, a man could break sod on 640 acres. Thousands came, school teachers, the sailors, miners, merchants, and farmers. And those a somewhat questionable character. Most left in desperation. But there were some who stayed on the new land. During the First World War, the demand for wheat and other crops caused the plying of thousands of acres of rangeland. The farmer kept pushing his luck, kept breaking the land too fragile for the plow. In 1930, our country was experiencing one of the worst droughts of our history. Man began to realize the importance of unbroken rangelands. As the drought ended, hundreds of thousands of acres of farmland were seeded back to grass, for only grass could survive the harsh climate. We have learned a great deal since man first abused the rangeland. Some land is still abused, but for the most part, improved range management has strengthened a major industry, livestock production. In the old west region, livestock and other animals graze the rangelands year after year. You know all this vegetation isn't planted each year like a farm crop. It renews itself. It's perennial. These plants developed under grazing by native animals. Even insects were grazers long before man introduced domestic livestock. Grazing is important. The most native range will take on a new look when it's not grazed different kinds of unwanted plants will eventually replace the grass. The rancher has to know how long to hold his livestock on the range without damaging its many kinds of grasses. He has to know when to move his livestock to other pastures. Give the grass some rest. Let it grow back. Some rangelands, like the badlands and deserts, you won't find much grass. But you have to look at this country in another way. Its starkness kind of moves a man. The annual rainfall and melting snows are the only moisture on the rangelands. Now, if there's not enough plant cover, the water runs off, taking with it delicate topsoil. On rangeland in top condition, there is little erosion. The moisture is held in the grass and the soil. It's just as important for a man to know how to conserve water as knowing how and when to graze the rangelands. Those practicing good management are finding that grass is their most important crop. Many ranchers are putting up wild hay to feed their livestock in the winter. some grass year-round on the rangelands, 
As long as it's managed, the grass will always be there every year. There's no doubt about it. This country has to be handled real careful. Without some management, our country's major food supply would be threatened. There have been a lot of changes in ranching in the past few years. I think we're just beginning to learn about rangeland management. For years, we've taken native grass for granted. It's a way of life, the only one I've ever known. And we do find, just in the past few years, more of our young people coming back to this way of life. I think maybe they realize there's something here that maybe some of us older ones haven't recognized. But there is a freedom and elbow room, you might say. You just have to accept as part of your compensation in ranching. you've seen how this country works for a man and how a man has to work with the land. You've also seen how the rangeland works for the livestock business. But there's more. The rangeland provides a home for all kinds of wildlife. Wildlife depending on the rangelands for their very existence. for food, nesting grounds, and shelter for countless wildlife. And where you find wildlife, you're going to find man. Recreation is now generating over several million dollars each year in the Old West region. There are a lot of people looking for the solitude of the open expanses. I enjoy getting out in the hills. It gives me a, a peaceful feeling about myself that I can't seem to get anyplace else. The big thing I think that we all enjoy and the first thing we notice is how beautiful it is or gee the wind is different today than it was yesterday. The grass looks different. Every time you go out you've got a different situation and what we enjoy most I think is is the outing. The having the chance to use the private lands that belong to friends and ranchers and neighbors. We know the game is there, and if we get it, fine. If we don't, fine.
recreation has to treat it with care. It doesn't take much to scar this land. Like Daniel Webster, there are still some who think of this part of the country as wastelands. They look to the rangelands for industrial and urban sprawl. They're not aware the rangelands produce our finest meat. Rangelands that are becoming smaller every year. Strip mining operations in the old west region are pulling coal from beneath the delicate topsoil. Ton after ton to meet our energy requirements. Rangelands hide more wealth, oil, natural gas, uranium, and other minerals. And it's all placing pressures against our rangelands. have to take a hard look at the rangelands. We're going to have to decide how we're going to use and protect them. A lot of our people depend on the rangelands, especially the rancher. He is faced with supplying meat and fiber to our nation. And he's also faced with heavy costs and unstable prices for cattle and sheep. It's just more economical to hold livestock even longer on rangeland. A fragile land, demanding good management, assuring the survival of rangelands and the livestock producer. The rancher knows the story well. Grass is the, is the basis of any, uh, any ranch, and it's especially so uh, for sheep ranch. You have to have a, a range and good range. Uh, and you have to take care of it. If you abuse it, you're out of business. There's just no way to get around it. And sheep, uh, properly managed, are uh, easy on the range and, and as good for the range as any domestic livestock. Many people, for some reason or other, have the idea that sheep are hard on the range. If you have the proper management, sheep are, are as good or better for the range as uh, wild game. There's been a lot of changes in the, in the sheep business. Uh, numbers have uh, reduced substantially. Uh, competitive position has uh, changed with uh, synthetics competing against wool. Lamb becoming a, more of a specialty meat. It's a good life. I think that uh, there's a good future uh, for somebody that wants to put the, the work and the effort into it. John likes it. He's the uh, fourth generation on the ranch. He has a son whom I'm sure that look forward to it uh, someday. He would look forward to his son uh, running the ranch. Uh, it's one of those... Uh, Things you put more effort into it because it is a long time family owned ranch. Uh, 
I was born and raised on this ranch in 1937. And my dad, he was born and raised on this ranch. And he's 66 years old. And my grandfather had come from the old country in oh, approximately 1880 and accumulated all this ground. And I've got a boy that I hope someday they'll be in the corporation. I think he's capable of taking it over someday. Have you ever seen a shadow creep across the land? Well, it reminds me of a giant hand reaching out for the rangeland. Major John Powell probably saw the same shadow, for he knew that as long as man used the land, he would have to practice sound range management. Management that would guarantee a food supply, habitat for wildlife, recreation and clean water. Not a bad way of looking at it, is it? Mm -hmm. 